Clouds presents a portrait of a community, really this community, taking inspiration from networks in the design and structure of the documentary. So while Clouds was born at a hackathon, like Golan was mentioning, um, it really uh, began in its current form here at IO, where we collected a, lot, a large portion of the interviews in 2012. It was Jonathan and I, we were holed up in our hotel room, we didn't get to see any of the talks, um, but instead we were polling a lot of our friends and mentors uh, who were attending the conference uh, to sit down with us and have conversations about their work and their ideas. We were very curious to capture uh, both the individual stories of these artists, to know what drives their creativity and invention of new tools, but also to capture a more global perspective on how they see technology, computation, and algorithms catalyzing radical changes in the world and shaping our reality. And we really use these conversations as an opportunity to engage the artists as collaborators, too, because we were exploring what this film could become. We wanted it to be part documentary, part media artwork. Um, and when we asked a lot of the artists what they would have done with the data themselves, the data that we were collecting, uh, it became very apparent that it would be interesting to explore it as a piece of software rather than a linear film in a way that enabled a viewer to explore their own curiosities while uh, navigating the, the, the work. So this year we've had the opportunity to uh, present Clouds at several major film festivals. We always envisioned the project as a gateway drug, uh, delivering these ideas to the widest possible audience. Um, for a younger generation, we hope it serves as an introduction to the field of software art. Um, for those of us kind of already midway in our creative paths, uh, it might remind us why we fell in love with this work in the first place. So um, we're honored to take this back to IO as like a homecoming, as Golan said. Uh, and I just want to thank um, and mention that over the last uh, two years, we've worked with over 20 artists and designers and uh, programmers to, to build what you're going to see. So it's really a, a multi-sourced effort from a lot of different people. And the visualizations from the people we interviewed are also embedded in the, in the application. So our system has no uh, fixed beginning or end. Uh, it's a film of indefinite duration. We sometimes call it an infinite conversation. Uh, it contains over 50 interviews, 10 hours of talking heads, and uh, 70 visual systems. Uh, it's a web of ideas uh, and code connected by chutes and ladders. So before we start, um, we'd like to show what's under the hood. So it's, it's a massive piece of software um, built in C++. It runs in real time. Um, everything is live and generative, from the visuals to the soundtrack uh, to the story engine. It's a bit terrifying uh, for us presenting it on, here on stage uh, because there's always the lurking possibility that the thing might crash. Um, so, you know, we've shown it as an installation often, but today we're presenting a, a real-time director's cut. So we're navigating on your behalf, essentially, so experiencing it vicariously. And we'll be guiding it through a series of topics that are um, by selecting questions that it presents. So we're not exactly sure where it's going to go, but we hope you enjoy. Uh, the journey. So my entry into creative coding was from a more traditional, uh, kind of coming at it from a more traditional computer science background and then also uh, an art background and then meeting in the middle and seeing the, the potential there. And also seeing the use of um, creating languages specifically for this intersection. Sort of like what I knew and what I, what I wanted to know suddenly became really clear. And so I started learning to program when I was about 26 or 27. And, and then I, I really learned when I, when I got to the Aesthetics and Computation group and started learning from Golan and Ben and other people there. 
I had done uh, some programming when I was a kid. I learned basic, I learned assembly. And I, even when I first moved to New York as an adult, I took an evening course in C programming. And I thought, programming, I, maybe I'd like that. You know, I'll take a course in that. And I didn't like it at all. <laughs> And that's how I learned how to program, was I addicted myself. And I'm highly addicted to programming. You can't stop me, sometimes I forget to eat. Sometimes I forget to sleep. And I don't know, can you turn a pickle back into a cucumber? Probably not, so I'm here for life. <laughs> you've, you've got me, it's terminal. Terminal disease. I spent about a decade exploring, like doing many different media, doing installations, doing printed work, um, doing a little bit of fabricated work as well, and collaborating with architects, collaborating with fashion designers. And what I've learned from that is that software is what I love the most. My own background is from math and art history, which seem like polar opposites, but it was really like the two things that I was most interested in, and then that turned into kind of like design and programming, which then turned into data visualization and has sort of blossomed out from there. Programming for me is always about, the, more than it is talking to a machine, it is about figuring out how to break down a complex concept or system into such small components that they can actually So the system has presented uh, two other questions and, and to us, so we're going to pick a new one to change the path. And analytics can be applied to anything. You want me to do it? Here. Take, don't take that one yet. Don't take that one yet. <laughs> don't, one yet. don't take that, that one. one. Yeah, yeah. That's the one for the end. <laughs> Can I take it? Code Sorry, go, for it. Yeah. go for it. Go for it. Build a set of instructions to specify a behavior that can live and run independently of any any human being. For, for me, it's very much a, a continuing oh, process of exploration, of discovering yeah, one yeah. form or one it's structure, uh, or uh, you know, you a, an approach in. to a certain uh, algorithm, yeah, and then the um, yeah. seeing where that takes me. And then the next time I wake up in the morning and think like I have to make a new piece, I might build on something that exists already, or I might take it somewhere else. When a project has arrived, and that's obviously that's a classic difficult one, isn't it? Do you mean like when I'm happy and it's done? That's usually a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> that's more like gardening or hunting. And, and I, I, I'd, I'd like hark back to Brian Eno on this. I mean, he's done a lot of generative stuff in the old lab there. And he's kind of a you know classic engineer tinkerer thing. And if he finds something interesting, he just sort of like draws a circle around it and says, well, that was the target and I hit it, you know, and then you ship it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like sort of like getting the old prize pumpkin. And I was like, I'm a pretty good pumpkin farmer, and you know, I have good years and I have bad years, but it's not like I engineer pumpkins. I kind of know where the seed is, and you know, I know a few certain you know, like pumpkin growing yeah. tricks, but you know, there's a certain amount of randomness. Really and you there. can't like move the volition onto the pumpkin and then yeah. say, well, you know, the pumpkins are stubborn this year. I can't think of a <laughs> So now we're seeing a visualization of the cluster map, and we're essentially traversing from the current node into a new topic. For example, on the flight here from Los Angeles to, to Minneapolis, um, you look out and you see the riverbeds flowing. And sort of like, how did that line get formed, this meandering line that sort of switches back and moves around? And the answer is it emerges over time. Um, for me, the important thing of emergence is that things are a result of a process um, where you have many elements. In a case of like a, in, in the world, um, infinite number of variables sort of um, working together to, to cause something to happen. I think the most simple visual example is um, birds flocking or, or fish uh, schooling. 
where each, each fish is its own autonomous sort of um, animal. And, they, and they, they have a few basic um, sort of guidelines that they follow where they, they try and stay away from others, they try and move in the same direction. And as a result of that, these, these basic um, behaviors of these creatures, you see these extraordinary um, sort of secondary forms, the, the flock from the individuals begin to emerge. <laughs> what is the connection between the initial state and end up and the rules one. and the kind of take behavior? If we should take the next question. Oh, so, not um, music. And the answer is no, that there's the one on the right. You yeah, can't predict what it'll do without actually running through every single step. So and Conway's game of life in that way is strongly yeah, emergent. This is short. <laughs> the way that I really see it is that. Um, Yes, I am a pro. Sorry, Marius. So, 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 だんだん I like what I've, I have a, well, I lack a better term for this, but I like what I would call like audiovisual concepts. I like things that are sort of, there's a, there's a trick or there's a, there's a, a statement or a gag, maybe is a bad word, but there's a, there's an idea that is um, less about how it looks than about a way it behaves. Um, and that that for me is an interesting kind of content to explore. So in a way, we've kind of looked away, and in nights with beers and cigarettes, jamming in the art school, uh, we played a lot on electronic uh, music instruments. Ableton Live was just out, and it was a big, uh, big thing. And so I kind of realized I wanted to make. I'm, I'm, I didn't have the patience, basically, to build static things and craft them until they're finally there, and it's not really what we want to do. So we, essentially. We still like to capture that spirit and that energy that comes with the uh, synchronous um, happening of sound and image. And there's so many different ways to do it, to show it, to explore it. And that's kind of what drives us. For my master's thesis, uh, I made a bunch of projects that were all um, different attempts to get at this idea of a kind of performable uh, image. In particular, the thing I was interested in was, was, was it possible to make something which was simultaneously a, a visual performance instrument and also simultaneously a sound performance instrument, and to be able to perform both simultaneously with a single mark. And in particular, um, to do this in a way that was completely gestural, where the, the gestures that the user <laughs> put into the system were, were, were not only the thing they were creating, what you saw, but were also the ways of controlling all of the dynamism in sound and in image simultaneously. I didn't want to have control panels or dials or sliders or these other kinds of things, which seemed like um, useful crutches. And I made this thing that responds to sound, uh, the reactive square. 10 squares that respond to sound, kind of an ode to Malevich. 
and my kids would make sounds like, you know, man, man, the skirt would change, and then they'd laugh and be happy. And then one day, we were at a computer store in Tokyo, and of course, I walk up to the computer and begin making sounds like, ah, ah, you know, and, and nothing's happening, of course. And the computer person says, like, you know, what is wrong with your kids? <laughs> and I began realizing that, oh, maybe there's a way to make things. And so I make things for my kids to play with. Cuantas más horas de juego tenga un niño, eh, más sano va a ser. De alguna manera, como, como reconociendo que en el juego está, está la habilidad, como si fuesen glóbulos blancos, como anticuerpos naturales, psíquicos, que nos permiten, nos dan, van robustuciendo nuestro, nuestro aparato psíquico y simbólico para poder procesar cosas en el futuro. <laughs> Sometimes we get stuck. <laughs> This guy's got a solo. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure to take it or it'll jump us back to the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've reached a juncture, um, kind of a, an intermission in the, the network, and so you're seeing this, this backdrop, um, which is the conversation visualized, and we have before us uh, a set of new questions to choose. So at this point, we could dive into any other part, but rather than us choosing, I think we're going to bring someone on stage, actually a guest from CMU, the studio, uh, Maddie, and she'll replace me interacting for a minute. <laughs> Hey, good to see you. Hi. You can kind of take your time. Okay. The, the question of who owns the internet is something that nobody really thinks about. You know, it's this thing that people just take for granted as free and out there. Um, but then looking at the corporate powers that are actually controlling that, um, is something that for the average person is probably a revelation, you be as he was describing. But it's something that is really necessary for us to be conscious of. It's kind of this thing that's out there. Sometimes we talk about it as the cloud. Um, it's uh, kind of floating above us. Uh, and we don't really understand yeah, popularly, like, like In our collective unconscious, we don't understand what's going on, but we're becoming increasingly reliant upon it. Um, so someone like Julian is ready to criticize so if you put your hand the fact down, that we don't understand over. this thing that we're carrying um, around in our pocket in a way. But so yeah, sort of how we feel. What the hell is inside this thing? How does it work? You know, what does it know about me? <laughs> Again, we're still on Earth. It's, it's, there's still systems, they influence each other. It's a cloud is, is part of like the strata of like skin that's made out of atmosphere that's surrounding the globe. And something that happens on one side of it influences the other side. It's a single organism. And that influences like the substrata. So also if you want to, you can check out the questions Earth off the side. On the and, surface, you and that influences ones, the core, you, you know, and like so to think of of something where we're floating, you know, I, I can't really buy into that, but um, it's, it's a good metaphor because it certainly feels very much like we are alone together, you know. I've, I've suffered from so many hard drive crashes. I, I don't trust myself to store my own archives anymore. I just I get an Amazon S3 bucket and I just put things on the cloud I've lost CDs and hard drives, like lazy hard drives and things like that. This is a fascinating thing when you think about what's actually happening you somewhere out there. There is a teeny little metal disc or uh, 
thing that is changing state from one to zero. It's leaving these traces of our thoughts and our actions, and actually even when we view something. There is definitely a kind of aesthetic uh, direction that culture is taking that is influenced by computation. Um, uh, I don't know if I would call it a movement uh, because that implies some sense of uh, intentionality. Um, but I would say that we are now appropriating the aesthetics of debug screens, of presets, of defaults uh, way more than we ever were before. Um, uh, the, my, my favorite example of the new aesthetic is uh, in 1974, Michael Jackson danced the robot on, uh, on TV for the first time. Um, and he wasn't dancing the robot because he wanted to understand computers better. He was dancing the robot because it looks awesome. <laughs> robot vision glitch core kind of, you know, <laughs> machines as our friends, you know, just kind of new ways, novel ways of viewing the world. It's not a question of whether these things are happening, it's a question of how we want to describe them. So because the tag new aesthetic exists now, we can talk about them as, as new aesthetic phenomena, and I tend to think that's very useful. Um, of course, it's become controversial for being essentializing and overly simplistic, uh, but I, I find it pretty useful and relevant. And things like machine learning and object recognition, those come out of that project of artificial intelligence. And, um, and I think we've imagined them as part of this like computer brain that works like a human brain. And I really don't think that's gonna happen. I don't think it's gotten any progress, really. But those actual techniques of Sorry. object recognition and machine learning has gotten Sorry. better, and they've it's really gotten right. good recently. Like, those are starting to come up not as intelligent robots that come around and understand our world, but as tools like Google Image Search. It's the vibrant community of dedicated people who are just so willing to share and help each other. It's, 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 it's so obvious by reading through the forums, of the processing forums, and by uh, seeing people at conferences or meetups and how they share and teach each other. And the, the, just that sort of willingness and desire to sort of share and learn that comes with the community of people that, that, that use you, these open source. So this is Adam Carlucci, <laughs> a, a member of the Open Frameworks community. <laughs> In general, everyone in this community um, so is used to sharing in some way because we all know that everything we do comes from the fact or we can work the way we do because other people have shared code or build open source tools. I think that spirit is very strong. Is this based on your hand position? で、<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> どのコンピューターでも使えて便利だなと思ってた。なんかどんどんみんなのものになっていく感じみたいなのが面白いなと思って。多分そこが一番公開するときには重要なポイントになるんじゃないかなと思ってますけど。I think again it is a little bit becoming insular that we have in a way all those tools we have now which we are supposed to be Data as narrative is something that's really interesting, and the idea that um, you know, when I talk a lot about the the fact that our lives can be documented through through data, and they are being documented through data. You would live your life and accrue all of this data and all of all of these things that all together create a constellation of your personality, and then model that personality and put it into a computer that then future generations could interact with. 
So theoretically, like by the time we were all dead, people will have all this material and even this documentary to look back on and they'll see us speaking. And maybe if the technology is advanced enough, it'll be generative where we can like project our personalities and our own experiences into the future and answer questions that we never would have thought of or encounter circumstances that never existed in our own time. You know, or our great, great, great grandchildren can download the archive of our life and peruse at will. I think it's really interesting when someone disappears from the internet and then they can be pieced back together by the crowd. Um, I think another really interesting thing recently is this uh, functionality that Google added where when you die, um, they can auto-notify some amount of people that you are dead and that here's the password to your data in case they want to do something with it. I don't really keep um, oh, pictures and things like this, so it's hard for me to relate to that very personal kind of data collection and management, but yeah. So I think it would be really interesting one day if I um, just get an email like, hey, so-and-so died and they want you to deal with their data. Um, I don't know, I think that's kind of a big responsibility. I always think about this in relation to my Twitter, like, I essentially have a real-time diary of my life for the past five or six years, day by day, hour by hour, what I'm thinking about, what I'm reading. Oh no, we might have lost it, actually. It's alternately terrifying and amazing to think that I could go back and retread my life like that. Um, or to think that someone in the future could go back and read that. So this was a visualization of uh, everybody's Twitter from uh, the, the time where the documentary was made. Exciting time. I mean, right now we have computational power and storage, so uh, I think we which is really the enabling portal. radical so new ways. Is it of what is the hotkey, right? Are you sure it was Z? I thought it was Shift Q. I mean, so now you have this thing where people are creating their own personal archives, right? Online, you have your so all your images in, that you've ever taken, um, you know, all the emails you've ever so sent. So the, the reason we added balloons at the end uh, is because we have a surprise for everybody. Um, so, oh, okay, we'll let it, we'll let it roll. Um, you can, you can I'm wait really to anxious find out. to talk about the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, the credits take a while because there's a long list of amazing people who contributed. More to the project. Um, we have some of our collaborators here mm -hmm. in the front row, Surya Matu, who worked on a lot of the systems, uh, the back end stuff in the story engine, and 
uh, Ellie Zanineri, who is responsible for interaction design and visual systems, um, along with Porter. Luke Dubois, um, our composer, um, Winslow Porter, producer. Um, along with probably uh, some of the artists uh, featured in the film in the audience, Rachel Banks and Lauren McCarthy and Kyle McDonald, so um, Omer Shapira. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been working on this code repository for um, just uh, over, over a year, almost two years now. And as of this afternoon, all of the code for clouds is public. So um, you... <laughs> So it, um, we're really opening it up as uh, a conduit for all the work, amazing work that people have done in this collaboration. If you look at um, the commits, uh, there's you know over 25, or I think 20 or 25 people have contributed um, actual commits to this code code base, um, and a lot of it was taken from example, different processing examples, a lot of really introductory content as well as advanced visual systems that we actually commissioned from different artists. So um, because not all the data is online for the entire the experience that you just saw, the first value of it is really um, the visual systems, the, the interstitial moments that we were seeing that can all be run independently and hacked apart and brought into your own projects or looked at for examples. And as we continue to develop the project, we'll look for ways of you to be able to release the, data, the actual video data that, so you can watch the sequences and explore uh, yourself. So. And so the repository serves two functions. One is as a history of the project is kind of like a ship's log um, for our journey over the last few years. And so you can kind of go back in time and see that commit history. Um, but then also, we wanna, want this work to kind of disperse into the community for other people to use um, for incorporating into their own projects, um, developing new things, maybe even contributing to cloud. So it's possible that this could continue growing kind of endlessly. Uh, and then also, we've always thought of clouds as an educational project and uh, a kind of archive of this community um, at this point in time. Um, so we hope that you know in the future people will access both uh, the documentary as an application um, and the code um, to kind of understand what people, what you all were thinking about and working on um, between the years of I guess 2012 to 2014. So, so. yeah. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, does anybody have any questions? Maybe pick people. Just a show of hands, I guess. At the film festival, it was presented in three different ways. Um, uh, the primary way was an installation. So we'd show it like it's shown on the Oculus Rift outside, where kind of people could queue up and watch it. But then we'd also present a room-like environment that had this setup, where people would um, use the Connect interface so they could kind of share in like a large-scale screen. Um, and then we'd do these type of guided tours as well. But it is one system that works across those platforms. And so ultimately, we um, intend this for distribution so that people at home can explore it using an Oculus Rift or you know, just as a, as a screen-based interactive um, experience. Yeah, I think you mentioned this at the beginning, but I've completely forgotten, I think, your answer. Uh, when you were taking these films of everybody, what was the progression from OK, so we want to have this as a documentary to let's take this further, and, and how can we actually deliver a unique experience that people haven't had before? Well, as we said, uh, we would engage our interview subjects in a conversation about the form of the documentary. Um, because so many of the, the, the artists work with software and data visualization, we really wanted to incorporate their, their insights. And I think it was Karsten Schmidt who was the first person who sort of suggested like this could really become an infinite conversation, an engine that puts together sequences of snippets, but we didn't exactly know how that would work. Um, but I think from the beginning, the fact that we were recording the interviews in RGBD, it's a very flexible, malleable medium. And so one of the, the first ideas for the project at the studio was called Point Cloud Portraits. And so we gave the data back to the artists to remix their own you know, point cloud data and make something out of it. Um, and so Rachel, <laughs> Rachel was one of the people to complete the assignment. Um, <laughs> and, and so, it, you know, it, it had sort of a real-time nature that was fascinating to be able to move around the form and to place um, the, the portraits, um, the interviews, in a kind of virtual universe where they could coexist with code. And that idea that, that you know, rather than having B-roll or video content, that you're 
conjuring up and compiling code that those people wrote um, to illustrate the idea. And so that was the sort of progression. And then implementing it took another year. So. And there, there was another aspect to it, too, which um, we, many, many of you may have seen this video that's online that we call Clouds Beta. It's like a, it was from May of 2012. And it was difficult for us to choose uh, linear paths through the film to make a thesis statement or something, because we felt like we left so many versions of the film on the cutting room floor, and that really different people we showed the project to responded to different aspects of the of what we had, of the interview content. So, this the initial outset was the idea that asking a question, the viewer could find their own path. That we wouldn't have to actually edit things um, beforehand, but rather the the view the film would become edited as someone interacted with it. Was the was what we tried to do. Yeah, and you could also see it as kind of. Um you know, when you make a documentary, often it's a, it's a process of finding the story and narrowing it down. And so, in a way, presenting it in this uh, format of a sprawling network um, meant that we didn't have to sort of uh, define the story, but we could let you know the viewer find a path through it and make those connections. Yeah, I'm just curious about sensing the volume of content. If you ever kind of thought about just if that was an issue, or if that was something that you wanted to consider, or um, if you just, it sounds like you just wanted to leave it infinite and sort of as an outer space. Hmm. Well, we definitely let a lot of the content, the, the sort of cream rise in a way, because the editing process was very hands-on, that we were manually creating all the links between the different clips that had been manually extracted from the interviews. Hmm. So um, I'm not sure if I'm totally answering your question, but we, we, we wanted to leave it open. Um, but we wanted to edit it such that you would naturally find the the best stuff sort of at the outset. Is there a question about grasping the entirety of it? Yeah, I'm just I see. Kind of wondering, you know, because I have no idea how much right. content you have, and I'm wondering yeah. if it's by design or if yeah. it's something that you haven't. So it's about 40 interviews, and so each of the interviews are about an hour, and then we cut it down to about um, 10 hours of edited content, so a fifth of it is used. Um, it's not a bad ratio, but we ended up using um, tools of data visualization. Actually, we, you know, it's quite a hard problem. So uh, we ended up using a, a program called Gephi, um, which is just a piece of software that's available. And we were able to input our, our large CSV file of all the clips and uh, with the metadata. With, so each of those clips has tags. And then that actually produced the graph. We were using um, a sort of a force-directed simulation to pull it apart and, and form these clusters. And so we did use those tools to identify the pr predominant topics. And that um, ended up guiding us in the process. And we'd say, OK, well, you know, there's a huge conversation around open source. Like, is, but you know, maybe we want to emphasize some of these other topics. And so then we'd go back and interview other people to fill in things like data visualization. So you know, we'd go to Cambridge and talk to Fernanda and Martin. And, and so we, we use those tools in the process of, of filling out this conversation. How many, clips are, how many clips are there and about how many tags are there per clip? I think there are about 1,300 clips. Yep. Oh, I, we have, we, oh, could we probably have the cluster map somewhere. <laughs> Do we even? We could, show, we could show the. We could show the cluster map if you can pull it up. Yeah. You can find it. Um, yeah. Some of the tools that we built are uh, opaque at best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, so you're seeing a folder with, I mean, there are all okay. these other tools yeah. we created to edit the content. So we have a, a, a tagging system. That'll work. Um, that's an old that's one. That's an old one. No. That's tiny. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, Go it's, to Gephi, maybe? Gephi CSV, yeah. There we go. That's, yeah. So each, each dot on this is a clip, and each line represents uh, a narrative link between them or a content link between them. Yeah. And so that, and, and kind of maybe in response to your question also, like the mag grasping the magnitude of it, we, we didn't want it to be numeric or didactic or quantitative. We wanted it to be more of this qualitative experience of being in this massive constellation. Yeah. And never really giving the viewer like, oh, you've watched 10% of it, or because it's really not about completeness, but about exploration. And we also thought about how that can be applied to, to other stories, um, ways of navigating content, um, you know, like something like all the TED Talks online that have transcripts. You know, if you could parse out keywords, you could end up piping those videos into a system that would then generate conversations out of the TED Talks. You know, so there are other ways of, of um, using this. And I think uh, also we like that metaphor, the, the idea that now all of us are kind of engaged in meaning making and storytelling in um, our queries and searches of, of the web. 
and kind of carving out these little paths and trajectories through um, that boundless space of information. And so how can we present a story in that way? Thanks for your Thanks. questions. <laughs> well, we'll be around. <laughs>